Hello everyone, welcome to the Kevin Lee Social. Thank you for tuning in. What initially began as an eight-part series interviewing entrepreneurs to share and inspire how they've successfully pivoted during COVID-19, I have decided not only to continue this series, but also to expand on the scope to understand and learn about people's craft, philosophy, the challenges they face in the industry, and their favorite failures that have helped shape them to become who they are today. By going deeper and understanding different thought leaders, businesses, and industries, the idea is to help cross-pollinate ideas applicable in your life and inspire action in this new norm we live in. I hope you enjoy the show. Thank you. Before we get on with the show, today's podcast is sponsored by Altitude Tea. Altitude Tea specializes in rare and exotic teas you can't find on supermarket shelves. Teas grown on high altitudes are more nutrient-dense due to the cold nights and misty peaks that slows the growth of the tea plant, leading to a higher concentration of aromatic oils and richer flavors. They are located in Waterloo and they do private tea ceremonies where you can learn how to drink tea mindfully using a traditional Gong Fu set and have over 20 varieties of tea to choose from. For our listeners, you can use the code BEYOND at checkout for 15% off. Today, we have David Booker. For the first 13 years of his career, David worked in the aerospace industry for Boeing and Airbus, covering a variety of technical and leadership roles in engineering, manufacturing, and quality assurance. Following a career change motivated by his passion for more sustainable and innovative food systems, David left Boeing and became COO of Hempel, an Australian hemp food startup, and subsequently the APAC regional manager for Hungry Planet, a US premium plant based meat company. In mid 2019, he founded Change Foods, which is recreating dairy products using microbial biotechnology and whose mission is to develop sustainable, healthier, and more ethical food supplies for the future. He is a graduate of Melbourne Business School in Business Administration and holds a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering and applied science from RMIT University, as well as a commercial pilot license for aircraft. Everyone, please help me welcome David. Hi, David. How are you today, my friend? Very well, Kevin. Thank you so much for having me on today. I appreciate you jumping on the call. I know that you're a very busy man, so this is much appreciated. Thank you so much. No, not at all. (laughs) I really like chatting to anyone that's willing to listen, so no problem. (laughs) David, let's begin with sharing your journey of starting Change Foods. How did you go from aerospace engineer to Palo Alto entrepreneur? It's a question I get asked often, but a bit of a transition from one industry to a complete other. But it happened actually personally when I changed my own diet. That's where it all started. I learned a lot about industrialized animal agriculture through some conversations and people that I met. And it was pretty shocking to me, actually, the cognitive dissonance that I had with how our food was actually produced to the point where I did a lot of research, was studying into it and was pretty shocked at just how inefficient things were, the treatment of obviously the animals and the supply chain. And all these things converged to the fact and to the point where I was listening to a lot of podcasts, doing a lot of reading. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to try this one night. And I remember making a bolognese, swapped out the meat for lentils and and, uh, mushrooms all chopped up. And uh, suddenly I was transformed. I was eating better. I was sleeping better. I never really looked back. I'm pretty creative in the kitchen. So that's really where it all started. And my just curious mind started learning more and more about new foods, new technologies, and it really piqued my interest to the point where I could see how technology can play a really strong role, I think, in curbing some of the effects from the ever-expanding need for high-quality protein over the years to come. And I could see how we can actually use these converging technologies from life sciences or just really good food science to actually mimic and produce a much higher quality protein than what people are used to. So it really excited me to the point where actually aerospace almost felt insignificant as a consequence, given all of the problems and issues that were contending with an ever-increasing food system globally. And uh, that's where it all started. That was about 2016, I think. 2016. Wow. It's such a big space that you're moving into, moving into alternative meat products, or in this case, cheese. Yeah. I love cheese, right? It's something that I've I really enjoy it. It's like a, one of those things that I have fun to with a partner once in a while, but having such an alternative, a great alternative for people to try is great. I once I, I remember speaking to you before about a little bit about this and you were sharing some facts about the impact of the current cheese production in terms of like how much water it uses and stuff. Can you share with us a bit about like how 
big of an impact or how tough a production it is to create cheese? Absolutely. Similar to you, I think people don't like cheese. They love cheese. We've got a very strong affinity with cheese. And when I made my own journey, transition to a plant-based diet, cheese was the most difficult thing to give up as it is for everyone. In fact, some people can't give it up at all. So it's really the final frontier, I would say, in terms of food products to really try and replicate. And there's a good reason for that because cheese can't be sufficiently replicated through plant-based alternatives. There's something very unique about the structure of cheese and the proteins as they exist through, I guess, that have been developed through evolution and through the animal. And plant-based proteins, unfortunately, don't cut it. And so there's a huge gap and there's a massive compromise that people have to make. And so I think that's the biggest barrier. And that's why really exploring and looking into what's out there to help solve this problem, that's where certain technologies can really do that. And that's where Change Foods really was born and started. And then I just learned more and more about cheese production, learned about the impacts of cheese. And I was really just trying to solve a consumer problem, but now it's just emerged into this amazing opportunity to actually solve a really high impact food product and make it much less resource intensive and be able to produce it in far greater quantities with much less inputs. And what really shocked me is the fact that cheese is the third largest greenhouse gas emitter of all food products per kilogram behind beef and lamb. That was pretty shocking. And the reason is because milk is already quite inefficient as a process because the whole dairy, uh, and this is from life cycle analysis. So this is very holistic going really from the feedstock food sources right through to the final end product. And there's been a lot of meta studies and reports published over many decades, especially within dairy, the dairy industry and also the meat industry. And it's very well published and known that the milk consumes a lot of water, land use, and it emits a lot of carbon. But of course, when you look at cheese, you need 10 liters of milk to create one kilogram of cheese, for example. So not only is milk already fairly unsustainable, you can compound that by a factor of 10 when, it, when you consider cheese, like a cheddar, for example. And that is why it really elevates itself up to the likes of beef and lamb and red meats in terms of its carbon footprint and, and water. It uses actually cheese even more so than beef and lamb is the largest fresh water consumer of all food products. So that's pretty astonishing as well. So the more you peel back that onion, the more you actually discover that this is a really intensive food in terms of its resources, what it consumes, what it requires. And also when you consider the fact that cheese is a largely increasing category within the dairy and food category. So milk is already in decline. Liquid milk sales are in decline for a number of interesting reasons. People's diets are changing. It's a very commoditized type product, whereas cheese consumption is increasing. So really, until you can figure out and solve and create a good alternative to cheese, you're not really solving any issues to do with the dairy industry, because if cheese is increasing at a ratio of 10 to 1, it doesn't matter what you do with milk. It really all really comes down to what you do with cheese and yogurts and so forth. Well, Thank you for the facts and the figures. Uh, it really puts in perspective, right? I had no idea that was the case, how much water was required, how much of an impact cheese was on the carbon footprint. So that was very enlightening. And it, it makes me more conscious when I'm about to reach for that piece of cheese now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a so you, pleasure. It's a luxury. Yeah. It's, yeah. Luckily, we don't eat tons and tons of it. And we do have small amounts. But nonetheless, because so many people enjoy it, and of course, the dairy industry has done a great job at trying to increase cheese consumption in every possible manner, including on pizzas. Now they've got cheese stuffed crusts and the kind of sweet cheese in every possible location and possible. But cheese consumption, even per capita, actually is, is on the rise. But, and that's the whole point of these technologies is that, look, I think there's a bit of an alarmist, I guess, sense in terms of climate change. And I think it's a little bit overinflated in large part, but Nonetheless, I think, what can we do with technology? What can we use to leverage and still provide the same experience that people are looking for? You don't have to give up cheese. We can just recreate it. So same products, different process. And that's what really appeals me to the sort of cell-based end of the spectrum, because that's really then going to be what's required to convince the mass market, I believe. There will be some early adopters, the early innovators that will adopt and compromise in some part, like vegans and vegetarians, and as they have over many years. But that's not going to cut it for many, the majority of people. The majority of people are looking for something that tastes delicious, that is the right price, that they've grown up to love, and, and food is ingrained culturally in so many ways as well. So I think that's where cell-based technologies really play a vital role with that mass market consumer. Yes, absolutely. And two follow-up questions for you in this space. The first one is, personally for you, why cheese? 
why did you pick cheese out of, you could have gone down different routes or was it because of this research, then you thought, okay, this is why I want to tackle it. When I left Boeing, I was at Boeing for about 14 years in the aerospace sector. I really wanted to learn about the food industry and figure out where the gaps in the market were and look at the technologies and figure out what the right solutions were, coupled then with what I felt my strengths were and where I could make the biggest impact. So I was, I went in an exploration phase. I didn't want to jump into anything too quickly. So I actually helped set up a not-for-profit organization called Food Frontier in, in Australia, which is Australia and New Zealand's leading think tank and industry accelerator for alternative proteins that was set up in early 2017 with Thomas King, the former CEO and now chair. And I provided a great platform to really systemically think about how can Australia get involved in this sector and how can we build a sector actually because there wasn't much plant-based products at, at that point in time in fact the, i don't even think the term plant-based even existed in australia back then so that shows how far it's come in just a number of years but that allowed me to really it created a great platform for me to travel the world meet some companies really understand the sector figure out what the levers were that we had to pull from a systems point of view but also how do we increase investment how do we get the regulators to come on board how do we really advocate to consumers how do we create a whole sector and figure out how to also diversify manufacturing in Australia to these more high innovation type products for the future. And I think all of these things converged and allowed me to really deeply understand and learn about different technologies and how they apply. And so after about three or four years, I really fell in love with microbial fermentation or precision fermentation as it's now more commonly to, especially as it relates to, to dairy products. And so I think it's the right technology to solve for that particular issue that you find within dairy alternatives. And second to that, for the reasons I mentioned before, I think there's a huge gap in the market that exists with current alternatives that this product can actually solve for. I mean, we didn't need more plant-based meat products at that point. I could see how the market was starting to get quite saturated. There's many startups and, and we didn't necessarily need another one. I always feel like differentiating in some regards and creating my own thing. And so that's where I felt like there was still a huge lack in really good substantial cell-based at least or to base dairy products. And so that's where it all started. And that's where I, I really wanted to solve for that particular problem. I had to give up cheese, but now I can, I really love the idea of being able to recreate it, but using a, a different technology without the animal involved. You mentioned precision or microbial fermentation. Now I'm really curious about the process because we've talked about how damaging the process of cheese is to the environment in terms of carbon footprint and what this cutting edge process and development that you've created, how big of a difference is it compared to traditional development method and what does it involve so the audience and I can get a better picture of what's being done? Sure. If you look at traditional cheese making, you start with milk, obviously. You add something called rennet, which used to come from a calf's stomach. And in fact, this is the most interesting thing. Since the early 1990s, have actually been creating non-animal rennet. And that is a synthetic version of that same enzyme that used to be sourced from a calf stomach. And they've been using this exact technology that we're leveraging, microbial fermentation, to recreate it synthetically since the 90s. And so it's been widely adopted in the cheese industry for over 30 years, really. And so 90% of cheeses made worldwide today are made using non-animal rennet. So we're actually taking that same technology and now we're expanding it not only for the rennet, but we're actually now moving it into the protein, the macronutrients, because now the technology has advanced progressively over the last few decades where the cost point is allowing it now to be competitive within food, not just high value ingredients or pharmaceuticals or medical products, but now actually being really relevant for these macronutrients. And that's why we're really taking microorganisms, we're modifying them basically genetically. So looking at using the same genes that you would find in a cow that helps express those particular ingredients or proteins, and we're sequencing them in, into the microbe. So when it's fermenting, it's doing its usual metabolic processes and doing its thing as it's chewing up the sugars in the ferment uh, during fermentation and creating other byproducts. But because it's now got this genetic code within its DNA, it's also now producing that compound of interest. And so that's what happens during the fermentation. And then what you want to try and do is purify away that particular target product of interest. And in, in our case, it's casein because casein is the key protein that you would find in cheese. So we're, um, developed all the technology into 
enable us to do this. And once again, people have con been consuming this technology without really even knowing it for many years. And so now we're just taking and expanding it to the protein itself. And once you can solve for the protein, the casein, that's the magical unlock that then will deliver the functionality, the meltability, the stretchability that people are looking for, for example, in a good pizza cheese or a mozzarella, which current plant-based cheeses definitely do not deliver. And uh, yeah, so it's really analogous to, if you think about yeast used in beer making, you ferment it with sugars and it produces alcohol as a byproduct. Or if you think about yeast used in bread making, it's consuming some of the carbohydrates within flour. It's producing carbon dioxide, which is what leavens the bread. So we're just taking that yeast, or it could be a bacteria, or it could be other, another fungus. And now we're once again, just modifying it and instructing it now to produce that particular compound of interest. So I think that's the easiest way to explain it. Yes. <laughs> I, I think, thank you for that, David. It's a very quick explanation for, I think, a topic that is <laughs> very, very huge. With something like this, there's, I think it's also important to make clear the cheese that you develop is different to plant-based, correct? Like a, like a plant-based cheese. Yep. It is. We're developing bio-identical ingredients. So the casein that we're producing is exactly the same as the casein that you would find from a cow. So that's the key differentiator. It's bio-identical. It's nature identical to what comes from an animal, but without the animal. However, in the initial cheese making process, we will be using, it's like a hybrid style cheese because the cost is so prohibited to start with. So as the technology progresses and advances, as we scale this, the cost will come down over time. Then we might be able to go to a more traditional style cheese making method where you coagulate it. So we create basically like a pseudo milk substrate, which we can then add cultures to and actually split the curds and then be able to ripen them as you would with a traditional cheese making technique. In the initial instances, however, we'll be looking at this hybrid technology of an analog style cheese. So it will be using some other plant-based ingredients, but with our magical key non-animal real ingredient, dairy ingredient, to then actually create a cheese that is indistinguishable in terms of its functionality from the real thing. So that's step one. Wow. Exciting times ahead, David. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, no, it's a... It's really exciting. And unfortunately, we haven't really been able to consume a lot of the product yet because we do have to ferment it in food grade equipment. So we've been doing everything basically at lab scale right now. All food starts in the lab. This is no different. We've been doing all of the R&D and the product development in the lab, but now we're actually working with co-manufacturers to scale it in food grade facilities. So over the next few months, we're actually going to be formulating our cheeses with our industry partners. We've got two food industry partners that have come on board as investors as well. So we're going to be working with them to collaborate on some pretty exciting cheese prototypes, including mozzarellas and cheddars as well. Oh, I can't wait, David. Awesome. Yeah, very excited. <laughs> yeah, for sure. David, switching gears for a moment, you mentioned Food Frontier earlier in Australia. Could you share with us a little bit more about what Food Frontier is about and or how did it come about? Yeah, sure. It all started when I met Thomas King, actually, in, in late 2016, I believe. And we just started discussing and talking about things and he was educating me a lot. He was probably the first person that introduced me deeply, at least to a lot of these sort of evolving technologies, predominantly in the US and Israel at the time. He was looking at, at starting this not-for-profit, and but also with a few more years under my belt and being quite entrepreneurial with the previous business endeavors, I knew where to start and how to get things shaped up and, <coughs> pardon me, and structured in terms of the finances and how to go about the operational aspects and so forth, which was not Thomas's background. And so it was just a natural fit that we both worked together. And this really excited me being a technophile, becoming a loving innovation, loving how, seeing how technology can disrupt. And, it, and surprisingly, people say, well, how do you go from aerospace to food and what's the crossover there? But the more I thought about it and the more I've now figured it out, in aerospace for many years, we've been taking high R&D, high innovation technologies and materials and figuring out how do we actually create a supply chain out of them? How do we scale them? How do we reduce the cost as dramatically and quickly as we can to make them commercially viable for commercial aircraft, which is a very competitive, highly regulated, fine margin industry. And so this is the exact quest now that we're confronting in the food space with these high technology ingredients, the very high R&D, very high innovation and cost. And we, the, the key challenge is how do you bring them down the cost curve as quickly as possible? Because this is food, right? And food is cheap and it needs to be cheap to really tap into the mass market. That's a really key factor, I believe, in this because 
of the growth of protein over the next, sorry, the doubling amount of protein over the next 20 years is actually coming out of Asia and Africa. So people can't lose sight of that. So if we are really to be driven by some of the impacts of food and helping curb that and create and displace and create new alternatives to protein that are far less resource intensive, then you have to really think about cost. Cost is a key driver. And so this is the quest now that we're all facing, at least in the cell-based space. I think plant-based ingredients and plant-based products like the Beyond Meats and the Impossible, et cetera, they've done a good job at continuing to scale and continuing to reduce costs because they've been around a bit longer. And of course, their inputs are a lot cheaper. But now when you're considering the, this next frontier of cell-based products and precision fermenta fermentation-derived products, that's where there's a huge challenge. And I think my aerospace experience certainly lends itself very well to that. Yes, to speak to one of your points about cost, I'm also in the hospitality industry and food costs, they're skyrocketing. And mm. over time, besides the point of the environmental impact, it's the ever increasing price and the scarcity and how we're going to feed everyone, like the whole planet for the next yeah. couple yeah. of decades. Is that, yeah, that issue yeah. as well. Absolutely. Uh, Food security is a big one, especially in places that rely on importation a lot and get disrupted when things happen in the supply chain. Obviously, there's the U Ukraine war and that's had a huge impact. That used to be the breadbasket of Europe and produces a lot of sunflower. So a lot of the plant-based oils worldwide have been displaced and have increased dramatically in cost because of that. And of course, big food and big dairy and all of these consumers of these ingredients are largely affected because it's very driven by tight margins. And so they've had to reformulate or increase their pricing, which is not going to help from the consumer market point of view either. And this is all rolling together in terms of this pseudo recession that we're with now. And I think they're all inputs and factors that lead into that. But food security is a big one. And this is where this technology is actually very exciting because it requires far less land, 98% less land than conventional dairy for the same output, 65% less energy, about 94% less water. And when you consider all of that, it means that you can actually produce dairy in places that have never been able to produce dairy before. If you think about Singapore as a great example, they've largely relied on imports. They've got a 20, a 30 by 30 vision. So 30% food independent by 2030 is some of their national objectives. This will allow and help feed into that because they're now they're in a small factory actually be able to produce sufficient and vast amounts of dairy, which is pretty exciting to them. And they've got no land. So even if they wanted to, they couldn't really have agriculture and have dairy and food such as that. And also in places where the temperature is in desert places, for example, they find it very difficult to have a dairy and cattle. And so this is a really transformative technology from a food security point of view. It means you can localize production. You can actually have, I can see in the future that there's going to be towns that will have cell-based meat facilities next to a cell-based dairy facility, which will be able to supply a small community in the middle of nowhere, which then also reduces transport costs. And so this snowball effect of all of these impacts that this type of new future food can entail. And of course, it's cleaner, it's more shelf stable, there's less microbial activity, there's no fecal contamination from animals, there's no antibiotics used in the food system. These are all massive issues that we're contending with, which is silent. Yeah, the silent part of food that we don't really understand or know about. But I think microbial resistance or antibiotic resistance is a big threat to us, actually. So there's 250 antibiotics used in the meat industry right now and meat and dairy industries. And so that's a lot. So if we can cut all of that out by having a cleaner process to produce the same products, then also that's a big one from a food safety point of view. This is truly such a game changer, David. I like the revision you've brought out, it makes so much more sense and it actually has a positive future outlook because sometimes if you don't see that other end of the scale, you're thinking, what's the way out of this? It's, it's eating everything and consuming everything without creating. But luckily we have people like you who are creating more than we consume. So, well, at least we're trying to get there. That's and, right. And I, exactly. and I can see that eventually not just households, but even like restaurants and stuff like that, they'll be able to incorporate more of these into the restaurants because like you said, price is price is key. And with, ev with the ever growing prices in, in food, the restaurants and everyone else has to pass on these costs. Mm -hmm. But if they're eventually able to access these alternative cell-based products, then they can create something still amazing and delicious, but also reduce price eventually to the main as well. 
And the true cost of meat and dairy is actually much higher than what people actually currently pay for. We don't realize that, but the government subsidizes a tremendous amount to actually make that whole system profitable. And even then, it's only profitable by a very, very slight margin. And so that's why intensity is so important. Industrialization is so important because otherwise it wouldn't be profitable. And there's this romantic notion of what about free range beef and regenerative agricultural farming practices and so forth. I'm all for it. But the problem is how do you supply mass food systems with that process? And you can't, it's not scalable. It's only scalable and profitable when you intensify it. That's why 99% of meat, eggs, and dairy in the U S are from factory farms, industrialized factory farms. 99%. So if you're going to have this romantic notion about scaling that 1% that is free range, then it's not going to happen, especially when we have to double the output. It just doesn't compute. This is when we have to lend on new technologies and new real true disruptors to have a completely new paradigm on how do we actually create this. And it will take time. It'll go through the the innovation curve of disruption curves. It'll start with innovators that then go to early adopters, then we'll go to the early mass market, then we'll go to the late mass market, then we'll go to the laggards. As with any technological disruption, so it will take time. It's a generational thing, I think. Certainly when you look at Gen Z to millennials, they're certainly the largest adopters of these alternative products and they just get it. They haven't, they don't necessarily rely or have this long standing stigma of growing up with meat and dairy because diets have changed and their preferences have changed. And so I do see that in the next 20 plus years, as these children grow, and become the purchasers of products and have their own children and families, I think that there will be a large shift, I think, in consumer preferences and choices. Yes, absolutely. And I do agree. I think even they, the younger generation are influencing the older generation to yes. about their food choices. So it yep. works back up that way too. That's right. David, what do you see as the main issue with our current food system and your perspective? The main issue, I think it's really conversion. So if you think about calorific conversion or feedstock conversion ratio, I think it's called basically how many calories input does it require to generate a calorie output? I'm an engineer, so I'll always look at efficiency (laughs) as one of the main K drivers. I'm sure there's many problems in the food system, really. As with any complex system, it's got, it's a very complex, there's a whole political nature to it. There's an environmental aspect to it. There's a welfare aspect to it. There's a health crisis. I think the health crisis is probably, where do I start? Now I'm changing my mind. So the calorific conversion is is an interesting thing from an efficiency point of view, and it just goes to show how antiquated or inefficient the process. So let's start with that. So for example, beef requires anywhere between 25 to 35 calories input to get one calorie output. So there's plenty of food in the world actually to feed the population and increasing population well well and above that. The problem is it's a redistribution problem because 60% of grains go to feedstock, which then can only really feed 10 to 15% of the population that can afford meat. And there's a redistribution problem effectively, and that's driven by this large calorie ratio of conversion. The most efficient animal, I guess, is chicken. I think that's eight calories in to one calorie out. And so that's a problem. But the biggest problem now that I've thought about it and dwelled on it from thinking about it a little bit further is really, I think, just that the fact that biodiversity loss or biodiversity, the fact that we actually have, for example, six grains, which, which govern, I think uh, up to, I think it's 65% of our food system. And that's rice, wheat, soy, et cetera. The fact we're basically because of the age of uh, globalization and commoditization, we've now centralized many and centers around food. And we've had to do that because of the, the cost demands and the intensification of, and increasing profits requirements of corporations. There is a capitalist nature to it. No system's perfect, but that is certainly one of the consequences and out and of that process is that when you globalize things, when you centralize things for chasing profits and decreasing in consumer costs and prices, then you have to centralize, you have to intensify. And that's why from one crop like corn, you end up with so many different byproducts. So that blew me away. When I went to some of the corn processing facilities in Iowa and the Midwest, and that was pretty shocking to me, just in terms of, well, not shocking, it's interesting from an engineering point of view, but it was amazing, let's put it that way, shocking in a sort of awesome sort of way because of the fact that from one crop, they figured out how to really strip it down and produce so many different byproducts. It's incredible. And I just thought, wow, imagine if you could apply that to all of these foods. It creates anything from oils to feedstock to to, to sugars, to obviously just corn-based products, multidextrose, which is now in everything for good and bad. And I think that's a real issue because that's what's then led to the health crisis that we're now confronting, especially in the US. 
we think increasing obesity and diabetes, which is really a true pandemic, I think, which is here to stay. And that's largely driven by decreasing costs of these centralized food systems. So how do we diversify? How do we increase biodiversity once again, diversity within the food supply chain? I think that's really a true calling, I think, for the future. But I think that's really, I think, when you look at health, we're facing a massive pandemic in terms of sugar consumption, et cetera. I think that's largely driven by just the way that the food systems panned out over the last few decades. Thank you for your thought, <laughs> sharing of your opinion. It's clear that you've had a good deep think about it and it's a perspective I haven't come across before. So thank you for sharing that, David. My pleasure. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how to add to that. It's a very good brain dump and I was like, okay, I'll, let me simmer oh, on that. <laughs> so, much, so much to unpack and we... I probably did a bad job at properly articulating it, but I just said, it's just scratching the surface really. It's such a complex ingrained institution food and it touches on everything in every country. As mentioned, where do you start? I think, yeah. I guess, and I think that's certainly, I've had to really deep dive into a lot of these issues for many years over the last six, six or so years. And, and you have to learn a lot about it. You have to be intelligent about how these things work because you don't want to create another problem. We don't want to take one problem and then feed it into another problem. So you've got to, and at the same time, we don't have to strive for perfection. It's not like disruption doesn't come with a consequence. No, how do you improve things slowly? And that's why it's change foods. That's why I actually started the name, thought up the name of change foods, because change is an interesting thing. It's an action oriented word, it's a verb, but it's neither positive nor negative. Sometimes you have to change and some people don't like it. They're resistant to change. We all are human. The human condition is actually resistant to change. We don't like to change. We're creatures of habit and so forth, including diets and everything else. But at the same time, sometimes we have to for certain reasons or, but change can be for the better, and it, but there will be a, the consequence. And so how do we not solve one problem and create a massive other one? And I think that's something that we're always thinking of. It's always at the back of my mind. So to really understand impact, you have to look at both and understand the consequences of every action. And to really do that, you've got to then break down and understand the system and how it works and understand the levers and the, I guess the, the interrelationships between everything. And I think that's just something that my systemic mindset my, or brain maybe here from my engineering background thinks of that all the time, but that's why it's natural for me to learn about the food industry deeply and how that impacts everything holistically, because I want to make sure that whatever we're producing doesn't do something equally as detrimental. Yeah, absolutely. You've brought up some very great points there. You don't want to take one problem and create another problem. Like we, we want to be useful, right? We want to create more than we consume and <laughs> can't in doing so accidentally make another mm. huge issue out of it. That's right. Exactly. Uh, and to do that, you've got, you've got to have deep research and yeah. really dive into to that learning. That's right. Luckily, we have people like you, David. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, I'm doing what I can, and that's all we all can do, really. I think it's not just one person, or it's, it's everyone doing their part and adding their skill set and trying to figure this out and crack this nut together. I think I'm just doing what I can. Yeah. What are your current biggest challenges to reach in a wider audience and make that impact? I know Change Fruit is growing, as you said before, that you're working with these manufacturers, the two that you mentioned, but mm. obviously... We want to get it out there fast, mm. but cheap. And but what are the challenges that you yeah. are facing? That's a great question. By far the biggest one is cost, but that's largely driven by R&D and scale. So once again, as with any disruptive technology, you've got to figure out a way of how to make it ultra premium and not even feasible to start with and to make it then ultra premium, to then make it premium, to then make it and come down that cost curve, that ladder. And I think that's the biggest challenge. And we have to increase yields of the fermentation, of the organism for that specific compound interest. And there's a lot of technology and science that goes into that and the bioprocessing optimization on the strain level, on the fermentation level, on the downstream processing level. So this, you have to start iterating a lot of optimization, I guess, technically on the process itself to squeeze out as much possible output as you can from the inputs. And then second to that, you've got to then scale into larger and larger reactors or ferment fermentation tanks. A lot of the technology has stemmed from pharmaceutical applications previously, like antibiotics and so forth. And, uh, and once again, high value ingredients like rennet that I mentioned earlier. In fact, insulin is produced from precision fermentation as well to treat diabetes. So that used to be from pigs and now it's medically produced. And so when you think about high value ingredients like that, they don't require a huge amount of capex or in infrastructure because 
you only need a tiny amount for whatever your end application is. But in food, it's completely different. We need large and large quantities for an ever increasing market. And so scale is paramount, but you can't really take beer fermenters, for example, because this is a lot more sophisticated technology. That's why it's precision fermentation. It's not traditional fermentation. It's precision mm-hmm. fermentation. This is this large science element that has to also be incorporated into it because you want to you want to purify away one target compound and nothing else. So there is a lot more advanced sort of equipment and processing techniques required in the fermentation. So you either have to upscale or upskill, if you like, food fermentation equipment from traditional fermentation, or you take pharmaceutical type fermenters and then downgrade them to food. And so because Mm. this is the emergence of this new sector within the food space, there is lacking amounts of infrastructure worldwide. And so that is probably the biggest constraint with all the startups in our space, in the cell-based space, is where do you scale this manufacturing into large fermenters for commercialization? And so you either have to partner with large food companies that do have fermenters that they have to either convert or make use of for this, these particular products, or you have to build your own manufacturing, or you can use a co-manufacturer, but even with a co-manufacturer, a lot of them have come from pharmaceutical days where they don't have large amounts of capacity sitting there idle. So that's still going to be a constraint for when you consider food applications. So I think that's the biggest hurdle really that we all have to overcome and to build a new facility could take two to three years, for example. So as you're increasing the yield, as you're working on the process optimization, you then also have to consider how do you actually scale this? Because you need both of those things combined to actually reach the unit economics required for consumers in the food, basically. And so, you know, that's the biggest challenge. It's working on those two things simultaneously and bringing them to market as soon as we can. So it's a, not a this or that process. It's a this and that that's process. That's right. <laughs> that complicated. Yep. Yep. I think in future it'll change. I think there's a lot of, because people have realized that this is a huge gap, if you like, and wherever there's gaps, there's opportunities. So there's a lot of now people thinking about this and seeing the rise of these new foods and saying that actually there's a huge opportunity here to invest in new infrastructure. So I think in three to five years, this problem might be solved for because there'll be a lot more new capacity online. And then people might be able to just do a co-manufacturing contract to be able to produce these at scale for a large mass market. But in the short term, that's certainly a challenge that we have to figure out. Each company has to figure out separately. Yes. Say someone out there who has an idea to change the world in a similar space or industry, like in the food industry, like you're in at the moment. Being a deep thinker in this space, what advice would you have for? The biggest thing for me is always just understanding who you are first. Understand what your strengths are and what understands what motivates and ticks you. I think you've got to find your passion and then just do everything you can to support that because it won't even feel like work then. You've got to have that as your North Star because starting a new company is hard. You go through periods of, you go through extreme lows and you go through extreme highs, you go through both. But what's going to weather the storm is the fact that you're aligned with something that you're truly passionate and believe in and figure out what bugs you. What actually bugs you? Is it something in food? Maybe it's not. Maybe it's something in technology, maybe something in materials. Just understand what bugs you and you have to ask yourself, why does that bug me? And what can I do about it? Because if you're solving a genuine problem that you believe in and you're passionate about, because Things, different things bug different people. You get, you shouldn't try and fit a square peg in a round hole, but rather think about why does this particular thing bug me and what can I do to the best of my ability to help solve it? So I think the first thing is make sure that you understand who you are, understand what genuinely bugs you, and then make sure you can try and figure out to solve a problem passionately and do it full heartedly and go full steam at it. And trust me, it will work. You have to be committed. And the only way you can be truly committed is if it's aligned with solving a genuine problem that you feel that inspires you and motivates you will weather the storms or when times are tough. And I think if you can do it, that's first and foremost what you should focus on. Whether it be in food or otherwise, it doesn't really matter. Whatever you do, I think that's, that's a good, very, very important starting point. Yes, yeah, so 100% agree, David. Starting a company is freaking tough. <laughs> it is tough. And if you don't have a, a strong enough why, when it times get tough, you just feel like giving up. Even yep. with a strong way, you still feel like giving up. <laughs> that's right. It's tough. Yeah. it's tough. Yeah, it's really hard. It's really hard. And that's why, to me, 
this is such a complex, uh, for many people look at this and go, how do you do this? It's such a complex struggle. You had a mountain to climb, but it's funny because it doesn't even feel like work to me. It just feels like something I'm super excited by because I see it as a challenge and a problem. And I'm using my engineering mind and my passion to fuel me through to figure it out. And it doesn't feel like work. I'm meeting amazing people. Everyone's so, you start vibe. It's this weird sort of cliche sort of thing where, you know, the universe sort of does align itself to that energy and people are just so inspired by the mission. They want to join the mission. They can see how this is an important endeavor. And, uh, you find yourself surrounded with like-minded people that are really, um, on you, on this path with you. And I think that's what makes all the difference. It doesn't feel like work. It feels like this amazing, incredible blessing and honor to be able to help work on this. And so I think that's the difference. And the reason it feels that way is because I've really thought deeply about what motivates me and what, I, what do I feel is a really true problem and more so that I feel this is the right answer and technology and solution to that problem that I want to scale and bring to the market. I think you can find that then you're on a good path. Yeah. Well, it definitely comes through in the way you talk, David, about your work. You're passionate about it. You can tell it truly aligns with you. And it's like your life mission. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. David, you're, you're vegan. Am I correct? I am, but I've oh. been eating cheese lately. <laughs> yeah. But I have had no, okay. I am running it. <laughs> um, right. And of course, I'm doing a lot of travel. So I've had to be quite flexible because I'm also celiac. I found out four years ago, I'm actually celiac as well, which means I can't, I'm intolerant to gluten, which is a big shock because I've got a very restrictive diet now. I'm trying to be fully yeah. plant based uh, or vegan and, and gluten free. But when I travel, mm. of course, to places like the Middle East or India or Asia or even some parts of Europe. You've got to be flexible because it's too restrictive. Yeah. And, uh, and so I have been, usually when I travel, I'm vegetarian and gluten-free, but when I'm cooking at home or wherever I can have an influence, then yes, always plant-based and yeah. gluten-free. And I can't actually imagine ever eating meat again, to be honest. I think once you change your taste buds, change your lifestyle, the thought of it actually is a little bit repulsive. <laughs> it's quite mm. bizarre because I grew up in an Italian household and consumed a lot of meat and dairy. And I was the last person you would have ever thought to go vegan or plant-based, but things have changed and I actually feel better. I feel healthier. I feel I have a lot more energy. And, and so I don't think I, I really need to consume that again. Yeah. So I figured out how to live my life without it and still be very healthy and very nutritionally conscious about everything I consume and, and its impact as well. And so it's actually opened up a whole new opportunity and worldscape for me. Yeah, that's great. C kudos to you, David. It's uh, being able to switch into that lifestyle. And so that, that's just where it comes to a bit more of a personal question because I'm mm. trying to adopt more of a plant-based diet as well. I have my days and then there are, I, I go off days and I'm yeah. trying to move more towards it. That's what we call well, a flexitarian. Yeah. 30% 30, 30 of Australians actually identify as meat reducers or slash flexitarian. It's yeah. quite inclusive. That's quite a broad term, but I think it's, to me, I'm a very pragmatic person. Right? It's, to me, it's not about purity. It's about doing what you can do. Every bit matters. Something really stuck in my mind many years ago when we first started Food Frontier, where I saw a chart to show that 2% of people are vegan, for example, and you can spend all of this effort and decades and advocacy to try and make the third person, out of a hundred people, the third person vegan or the fourth person, and, or you can just get everyone to reduce by 10% and you've had a far bigger impact. And I think I love that pragmatic approach. Like, don't try to be perfect. Just do what you can. Everyone can do what you can. Some people have very different circumstances or reasons why they can't switch their diets. And it's naive to think that everyone can. I think you've just got to do what you can. And if it means cutting out meat once a week or twice or two times a week, good on you. If it means doing it three days a week and you can do that, great. We, all, we need all of these things together. And I think this is where these technologies and products help because it means that there's less of a compromise. So you can still substitute a burger. You can still have the same experience. And it, you know what? It's made from plants. Yes, it might be processed, but it's not there to be a health food. It's meant to displace another junk food or another. So <laughs> sometimes we lose ourselves in this quest for perfection. And that we're striving to always have this pinnacle in products, this amazing holy grail of has to be perfect, has to be the healthiest. And not, and it's just not true. I think you just have to be pragmatic and realist and say that, look, do what you can. Every bit helps. And then next day, try and do a little bit more and then try and do a little bit more. And that's what continuous improvement is about, I think. Yeah. Yes. So well done. Uh, well done. <laughs> Don't be hard on yourself. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. And, um, and uh, try new products. Be creative. Start trying new recipes. Try to do things different in the kitchen. 
and you'll be surprised. It opens up new horizons and you'll find flavors and challenges and things that you've never tried before, which I certainly did. So sudden, suddenly incorporating lentils and beans and all these things, which I never ate before I actually became plant-based and it's all for the better. Now I'm consuming a rainbow of foods and I, my biodiversity, my microbial health in my gut has probably increased dramatically because I'm consuming a lot of different fibers, a lot of prebiotics and probiotics and all these types of things, which, you know, so it does open up a whole new exciting chapter. And I think every little bit helps. Yeah. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you, David. Yes, I am enjoying the process. I uh, go out to the stores now and go, okay, that's, it's like a new boundary of container to be creative with. Right? That's yeah, how creativity exactly. works, right? It's that's you've right. got to set the boundaries and then you can experiment because if you have no boundaries, then you're like, oh, what do I do? Right. And now you're like, okay, all right, so this is what I've got. This is what I can play with and, and let's see uh, what kind of creativity and fun I can make out of it. With constraints comes creativity. That's one of my favorite yeah. sayings, actually. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And it uh, doesn't always work out to be the best, but it, no. yeah, I've got, okay, <laughs> I can try adventure, again. <laughs> adventure. Yeah. And we live for adventure. That's what it's, life's about. Yes. And you'll find amazing things. You'll find some bad things and you'll find amazing things and you'll transform <laughs> things, hopefully for the better, because the things that, you know, are, are better will stick. <laughs> And that's yep. what, once again, that's what continuous improvement really is as a mantra and every little bit counts. Yep. Yeah. Have fun with it. Thank you, David. Thank you. David, how do you balance mission and family? You're clearly a guy who has a strong North Star. You're originally from Australia and from my understanding in the US working as well. I mean, it's, it goes back to that conversation sometimes. You want to change the world and you, you want to put everything into it, but then you also have a life. Like mm. you, you have your family and friends. Mm. Maybe it's a... Uh bit of a naive answer, I guess, in some part, but I would say always try and find the win-win and if not the win situation, you don't have to give up something to be able to pursue another. It's how to incorporate it. So it's all holistic. And so it's not like I have to give up my family to pursue my mission. It's how do I bring my family on board that journey with me or bring the mission into the family household. And yes, it might mean a physical separation. And that is something that, I've, you know, so I've got two children, they're still in Australia. They're, they're a little bit older, which is why I think I could reconcile the fact that I can't be apart from them for a greater lengths of time because I can, they've got phones, I can call them anytime. So my son's 14, my daughter's 11. If they were, a bit, if they were five years younger, it would have been certainly more of a challenge. And I would have had to at least continue to work from Australia or spend more time in Australia. I think just because they're a little bit older, they're excited by what dad's doing and excited by what change foods is striving to achieve. And I can FaceTime them anytime. I think this is where technology is certainly helping a lot in that respect. And of course, when I can see them and when I can go back to Australia, I do it as frequently as I can. And of course, during their school holidays, in fact, I'm flying back there in a couple of weeks to bring them over here for two weeks for their school holidays. They're going to come over and, uh, and visit our operations here and see our lab and meet the team. But that's going to be a really exciting proposition for them. But Coming back to my point earlier, it's really just how do you create that win-win? It's not necessarily giving up one thing to pursue another, but if you're genuine about your pursuits, then you should also be truthful about that to your family and friends and loved ones. And if they genuinely got your best interest at heart, then they will support you on that and, and vice versa. You have to support your family and your loved ones and partner and everything else, but then it should be reciprocal. It's a true loving relationship. And I think that's what it's all about is how do you find, first of all, and connect with what truly motivates and inspires you and pursue it wholeheartedly and do your best to balance that with everything else you've got going on. And you'll find a way. Like I, I think in the overall scheme of things, I've figured out a way to balance and, have, and uh, be able to spend as much time with my children as possible, or at least communicate with them as, as frequently as possible whilst at the same time trying to pursue this amazing dream. That's a beautiful, David. I love that you're always looking for a win-win-win situation or yeah. like a, this and that situation. It's not a zero-sum game where that has to be the right. for that. Yeah. Yeah, always try and find, start that as your first guiding principle and then go back from there thing, right? And then, and then you may have to negotiate and that's fine as well. Negotiation is part of life and figuring out how to balance all of these things together holistically. But at the end of the day, start with the win-win and work back from there. David, we're reaching the tail end of our conversation today, and there's a, always a few quick questions that I ask all our guests. Um, yeah. Do you have any morning or evening routines? Oh, God. Okay. Mainly morning routines. I think my evening routines seem to flop, go out the window because I'm traveling and always moving around so much, and I can live a very dynamic lifestyle. Whilst in my mind, I would love to 
do an evening run every day, for example, that just doesn't happen very often. In the morning I do have a more of a re regimented process and that's really starting with a large glass of lemon water, room temperature, lemon water, first thing, huge glass. When I can, I try and have a ginger shot or an elixir type thing straight afterwards. Then I wait an hour, have my coffee. I do love to try intermittent fasting. I haven't done it for a few months, but I did it for a good nine months before I came over to the US. But once again, traveling makes that difficult. I, but I did feel a lot better on intermittent fasting. I was doing 16 hours a day. So I'd stop eating at about 6 PM and start up again at around 10, 10 the next morning with my first sort of milk coffee. But once again, I think that's my ideal situation. <laughs> the reality kicks in, but yeah, that's what I try and do. Do you have a favorite book you'd recommend? Oh dear. Or it could be a recent book that you've, you may have read that you'd like to recommend. Yeah, a lot. One which I found interesting is one called False Alarm by Jan Lombo, which looks at sort of climate alarmism, I think. And that was really interesting because being in the sustainable food movement, I think we can get swept away with our own beliefs and insights and ideas, but Bjorn Lomborgs spent many years studying sustainability and climate to really, truly deeply look at bringing together a lot of economists, for example, scientists together to figure out, look at the sustainable development goals from the EU, where there's a huge list of them and try and rank all of them or prioritize them in terms of the business case. So spending this amount of money will give you this much return. It's a very deep and confronting book, actually, because it does challenge your assumptions around climate and what we should be focused on. For example, increasing the, I guess, the poverty situation is probably the most impactful thing we can do for many things, not only for poverty and for human suffering, but also for climate, also for environment, also for sustainability. It all goes back. So it's really let's not get too alarmist about the fact that we have to try and curb and reduce greenhouse gases and be net zero as soon as possible, because I think we do have to do that, but at what cost? And I think we have to have the perspective to let's solve all of these complex systemic issues all together at the same time. So that one was quite interesting. I think that that's just one of the most recent ones that I finished reading and I found that really interesting. So I've definitely got to pick that one up. It sounds right up my alley. So thank you yeah. for the recommendation. <laughs> Pleasure. Pleasure. Are okay. there any new beliefs or behaviors that have had a positive impact in your life in recent years? Just reading and listening to many different types of podcasts and doing a lot on self-development and that type of thing. I think that's been really important, I think, to balance everything out and put perspective rather than just be so blindsided by one particular area such as food and we all specialize in life but sometimes taking the blinkers off and looking at things and i think i've been deep diving a lot into history and trying to expand into art and all of these other things and i think that's really important it's lost in some ways so i've been doing a lot of reading around the 20th century and looking at psychoanalysis and all of these type of things which i encourage everyone <laughs> to do because it broadens your perspective and i think the more we understand history and what humans have tried to achieve over the last few centuries really helps actually not fall into the same traps, or at least you can sense what's happening at the ideological level, for example, in the U S and all of those type of things. And I think that's been really refreshing. And so that's my reprise from my daily craziness of food and everything else that I'm involved in, but I try to always step back and listen to as much as I can and read as much as I can about things that are completely differentiated. Great advice, David. Great advice. If you could only send one single line of SMS text to yourself five years ago, what would it be? <laughs> Just hurry up and do it, probably. Don't sit and wait. The only regret is that I should have started what I'm doing now two years early. I was always sitting there, like thinking about it. And, and then one day I was like, you know what, I'm just going to try and find and just get into it and do it. But I wish I had initially reacted that way when I first thought of it. It is. <laughs> it would have been that. Yeah. David, you've been an absolute inspiration. Your advice, I, I've got to re-listen to all of this and look into <laughs> everything that we've spoken about and break it down. I, it's definitely one of my, one Thank of my favorite David. podcast episodes with you, David. Is there anything that we've left out or any messages that you wanted to leave for the audience before we wrap up? No, I think I've said enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you've it's, uh, it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a lot, there's a lot to go through there, but once again, I think it's just understand who you are. I think that's the first thing. And, and I think that's the most important thing out of all of this. It's really try and do as much to understand who you are, what bugs you and what problems you want to solve for, and just 
do it wholeheartedly and uh, things will open up for you. And finally, David, how could people reach out or learn more about everything that you do? I think the easiest way is just social this day and age. I'm very active, at least Change Foods is very active on LinkedIn, but also myself. And so LinkedIn is probably a great platform, but otherwise all the usuals. So yeah, our website's really good to look at. We try to keep that updated or there's some interesting content and videos and things like that on there. So changefoods.com as well. Yes, I second that. Changefoods.com. I love that website. <laughs> it's got all the facts and info. It's, it's it very engaging, actually. I really like it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, thank very you. well done. Thank you, David. I appreciate your time again. Much loved. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the show. All the links to the show notes will be available at kevinleesocial.com, spelled K-E-V-I-N-L-Y. Conversely, if you have any interviews that you'd love to recommend, please send it over to kevinleesocial at gmail.com. I'd love to connect. Thank you until the next episode.